Welcome back. Let's talk about these green stone belts. Now, uh, I'm trying to just give you a very high level of this and a number of other things. You know, I'm trying to get through, you know, uh, from the beginning of, of Earth to about 2.5 billion years at the end of the arc. I'm trying to get through, you know, 2 billion years of Earth's history. So if it seems like I'm going quickly or glancing over things or, or not getting too much detail for a reason, you know, I'm just trying to give you a high level of some of these things. Greenstone belts are, are going to be like one of those. Okay, so it's good to mention, not necessarily uh, all that super important that you know every detail. So a greenstone belt, and I'll explain it fully with diagrams, has three kind of major rock units to it. It has lower and middle kind of volcanic rocks, extrusive uh, igneous rocks, and then it has an upper unit that's mostly sedimentary rocks. So in the middle and lower igneous unit, unit um, a type of, of lava called pillow lava is common in these greenstone belts that indicate that volcanism was on the ocean floor. When um, uh, when volcanoes, when basaltic volcanoes tend to erupt on the ocean floor, it's very flowy lava, it forms these pillows. And they're called pillow basalt or pillow lavas. They look like fluffy pillows. So this is what it looks like underwater as that lava has cooled. Uh, above ground, if we look at a, a cross section of rock, that's kind of what it looks like as well. So kind of these fluffy pillows. So anyway, these greenstone belts have these pillow lavas, these pillow basalts, which indicate that the, these rocks formed from cooled lava under the ocean. Therefore, there had to be some water. There had to be some ocean. Okay, so if these rocks are 4 billion years old, oceans were around 4 billion years ago. So there's some evidence towards that. Additionally, you also get these ultramafic igneous rocks, these comatiites. Um, ultramafic magma, very dark, low silica-based magma, requires uh, surface magma temperatures of more than 1,600 degrees Celsius, which is 250 degrees Celsius hotter than any recent flows. Uh, during Earth's early history, because everything was a little bit hotter than it is right now, it could uh, allow for ultramafic magma to reach the surface. That's why we don't see these types of rocks being created now. It's not hot enough to get this stuff up to the surface. Okay, so again, ultramafic igneous rocks, rare in rocks younger than the Archean, and none occur now because it's just not, it's just not hot enough. The, the, the interior of the earth is just not hot enough. So we see these ultramafic rocks that could only have been produced when temperatures within the earth were hotter, again, billions of years ago. So here's an example of those, uh, what those uh, comatiites look like. They have these kind of striations on them, very interesting patterns. Okay, so we have the igneous rocks that make up the lower and middle units, and then we have the upper unit of this three-tiered rock layer uh, made of sedimentary rocks. Um, uh, many of these sedimentary rocks are, are a type of sandstone called gray wacky um, or argillite, which is slightly metamorphosed mud rocks so made of silt or clay deposits. So it's either sandstone or slightly metamorphosed mud rock that we see in this upper upper unit. So what that's telling us is that there must have been some erosive weathering, some sort of environment nearby that weathering and erosion caused uh, deposition of sediment kind of on top of these igneous layers. Um, in these sedimentary rocks, we see some small scale uh, cross bedding and graded bedding, which could indicate uh, turbidity current deposits. Um, if you remember back from uh, uh, depositional environments uh, a unit or two ago, um, sedimentary landslides in underwater environment causes graded bedding uh, because these uh, because of these turbidity currents. You get this um, downslope below water movement of of uh, landslide sediment and as it comes to rest on the flat ocean floor the heavier stuff settles out first and then the lighter stuff settles on top of that Be but because this stuff is kind of moving down and out you kind of get this cross bedding as well that that you see depending on how many successive um, 
turbidity currents there were. So again, what these green stoke belts are showing is that, uh, again, these sedimentary rocks, which most of the current rocks, sedimentary rocks on Earth that we see, remember, were initially deposited as sediment in or near the shallows of the ocean. And so we see that again. So again, these greenstone belts has some tie to a tie of formation to being below below the sea level. <clears throat> um, yep. So we talked about the, the three major rock units. Also, these greenstone belts have what's known as a synclinal structure or a U-shaped. We talk more about this in Geology 101. But let's say you have a bunch of uh, horizontal layers of sedimentary rock. And then due to some compressional forces, maybe a convergent boundary, plates are getting smushed together. Well, those those sedimentary uh, rock layers, or rock layers in general, are going to want to kind of fold up. And we get uh, types of folds called anticlines and synclines. And they usually happen one right after another. So due to compressional stress, maybe at a convergent boundary, right? let's say here, right, I'm going to push in on both sides, I start to fold this up. Or, again, I push it on both sides, I start to fold it down, all right, or up and down. So this is only happening because I'm compressing, I'm pushing, I'm pushing things together. So due to, uh, again, this kind of island arc convergence, it's crumpling these greenstone belts up. So we get these um, uplifted anticlines and then down-dipped synclines. The way I remembered it in my head is an anticline kind of looks like a capital A. Oh, here we go. An anticline looks kind of like a capital A, whereas a syncline kind of points down. And in some religions, if you sin, you go down to hell. That's just how I remembered it. That's just me. You can remember it any, any way you'd like. Um, but we have anticlines up, synclines down. And if we were to kind of erode that top layer off after all of these layers have been folded up, it might look flat on the surface, but below ground, if we were to look at a cross section, again, we see these anticlines and synclines, anticlines and synclines. So again, these greenstone belts typically have synclinal structure, kind of the, the, the U shape, the down, the down bend. I'll show you that here in just a second. Most of these belts were also intruded by granitic magma that cooled to form granite. Uh, additionally, low-grade metamorphism may occur in many of the igneous rocks, for instance, the, the pillow lavas, the pillow basalts. Um, when that occurs, when you get low-grade metamorphism, a little bit of heat, a little bit of, of pressure, you can alter the minerals. So you're changing the minerals a little bit. When you change the minerals, you change the rock, hence metamorphism. But what's cool is when... You, you're changing these metamorphic minerals when you're altering them a little bit. Um, those minerals tend to turn to um, minerals like chlorite, uh, actinolite, and epidote. And all of those minerals have kind of a greenish tinge to them. Hence, the greenstone belt. Because these igneous rocks, you know, under some weak metamorphism, a little bit of metamorphism, the the they've uh, the minerals have changed a little bit and it gives the rocks kind of a greenish color. So in any case, um, so here's that synclinal structure that we see. We have the upper sedimentary rocks, the middle and lower volcanic igneous rocks, uh, peridotite or basalt. Um, we also have these granite gneiss complexes that tends to alter greenstone belt, granite gneiss, greenstone belt, granite gneiss. Um, and then we have the intrusive granitic magma coming in there. So all of that kind of matches up. So in North America, uh, most greenstone belts, which are the darker green colors again, occur either in the slave craton or the superior craton. And they all make up the North American craton, but they were just kind of came together at, at different points. So um, when we're looking at the Canadian shield, the exposed rocks, we're either going to find these greenstone belts in the superior craton or the slave craton. And again, they call them greenstone belts because some of the igneous rocks, for instance, like the pillow basalts that maybe make up that middle or lower unit, um, when you kind of apply a little bit of heat, a little bit of pressure, and they get a low-grade uh, metamorphism, they alter a little bit, they kind of 
turn a shade of green, right? It's not like bright green. It's more like a, I don't know, like a drab green, but you can kind of see the greenish tinge to them. The minerals have changed a little bit. So anyhow, um, how did uh, all of this occur? How did these green stone belts form? Well, there's a couple of different models. The, 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 the jury is still out on which is the most correct one. Uh, so in the first one, there was some uh, back arc basin extension, so a divergent boundary on one side and a convergent boundary on the other side. So the extension caused um, partial mantle mel melting and then volcanic eruptions to occur. And then uh, you also get weathering and erosion, so continental sediment coming down onto it. Um, weathering and erosion of the island arc material coming down onto it. So then you get, again, you get igneous rocks on top of sedimentary rocks. And then that divergent boundary kind of closes off as this convergent boundary continues to push everything off into the right. <laughs> Excuse me. So that's maybe one way. So first it was a divergent boundary and then a convergent boundary. Back arc marginal basins. Or... Um, maybe there was kind of similar, but maybe some continental rifting. So maybe a, a rift, a, di a divergent boundary, kind of in the middle of a, a continent already, or continental crust. So you get some rifting. So as things spread apart, something's got to fill in that gap. So you get that magma coming up and that volcanic activity and lava oozing out. So you get some igneous deposits. But then, again, you get the weathering and erosion from the material on the sides of this rift, uh, dumping sediment on the inside. So now you have your igneous rock uh, covered by sedimentary rock. And then instead of the rift continuing, it kind of just gets closed off. Maybe the boundaries on the outside take over. And there's, again, kind of some convergence pushing things together. Um, oops, or island arcs kind of starting to come together. And so you kind of close that off and creating that greenstone belt. No one's quite sure what might be more correct. Um, for me, I don't know, this is just for me, model one makes a little bit more sense, but model two, you know, can happen as well. You get some pulling apart, volcanic activity occurs, stuff on the sides gets weathered and eroded and dumped on top. That divergent boundary that rift no longer occurs and you get something from the outside creating a compressional stress and now it's converging and squishing everything back together you know they both kind of make sense to me i guess they both kind of make sense to me so in anywho let's go ahead and pause here when we come back we'll talk about some mineral deposits of the of the archean some some things that we mine out of the ground now um that is thanks in part to what occurred in the Archeum. So I'll see you back here in just a second.